Hello, Brie. How are you? <laughs> Hello, I'm very well. How are you? <laughs> I am great, thank you. Uh, welcome to the Emetophobia Free Podcast. It's lovely to have thank you with you. us. Thank you. Thank you. It's lovely to be um, here. I've actually listened to every episode, so. Have you? Brilliant. <laughs> Super fan. I love yeah. it. Well, we're really, really pleased to have you with us. Um, so, Brie uh, Billington is a newly qualified Thrive Programme coach, um, and she has a brilliant story to tell. She was an emetophobe herself for most of her life, um, and she overcame her emetophobia with the Thrive Programme. Um, but I'm not going to say any more because Brie's going to tell her story, and it's a brilliant one. So, we're going to dive right in. Mm-hmm. Brie. Tell us about your life as an emetophobe. How long did you have it? What was going on for you at that time? Okay, so I had emetophobia from about the age of seven. So I think it was around 23 years. But I say it was seven years old because that's when I could attribute it to an event that happened. Okay. But going through the Thrive Program, I know now know that that wasn't true. Yes. Um, but at the time, I thought something traumatic had happened to me and then yeah. I had emetophobia from there so as a kid I would feel sick all the time and Mm -hmm. I would go to bed at like 5 30 at night because I thought I was like scared of the night time because nobody actually knew that it was a metaphobia and I would drink soda water all the time because I felt sick I never used to eat meat I would hardly really eat anything and yeah it was that's what it was like for my childhood yes so is that and then was it was it a metaphobia? Obviously, they didn't know it was a metaphobia. They thought it was anxiety. So it was sort of, I don't want to say misdiagnosed. It doesn't sound like it was diagnosed. But in your family, no. it was just understood that it was nerves or anxiety or? Yeah, I think they just kind of thought of me as like a shy kind of kid. Mm-hmm. Nobody picked up mm-hmm. that I was anxious or anything like that. I was just a bit different in how yeah. I would do things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then going through my childhood, like it didn't affect me too much. But once I started becoming like a teenager, that's when it really did start affecting my life. And it was really debilitating. Yeah. Okay. So what kind of things did it stop you from doing as a teenager? Oh, um, drinking alcohol, going to parties. I was really deep set in all my routines. Like I didn't want to do anything different. I wouldn't want people to cook for me. I wouldn't want to be around my friends in case they were like going to be sick. Yeah. Um, And then once I started working and I was around lots of people, I would have panic attacks because I was like so scared of being around somebody if they were sick. And I actually got um, into uni to become a teacher. And then I ended up dropping out because I was like, what's going to happen if I'm around kids that are sick? And then I ended up going into pathology, which is what I do now, but I was working in a hospital and I was seeing people be sick there. So then I ended up leaving my job And then it just kind of spiraled. Like I started getting, is it agoraphobia where you're scared of being like in public spaces? So like I couldn't even go into the supermarket, just the self-checkout without having like a massive anxiety attack Yeah, because I was just scared of being like in a space with other people. And I'm like, what happens if I am going to be sick here? And then it just kind of kept me at home and then I couldn't really do anything. I think it's important to understand that even if it's not diagnosed, even if you've never been to the doctors with it and nobody's actually said, you know, you've got emetophobia, you've got agoraphobia, the symptoms are the same. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't matter. There's, I've had a few people um, contact me over the, the past few weeks saying, I think I've got emetophobia, but it's not been diagnosed. So, I, I, you know, mm-hmm. it can't be that serious or, or I'm just really scared of this, but I haven't got anything. I've not been diagnosed. It, the label doesn't actually matter because if you are yeah. scared of going outside because you know <laughs> you might be sick then that's a comorbid symptom of a metaphobia whether it's got that label attached to it or not yeah yeah exactly and I didn't actually know of a metaphobia until I was around 22 so from yeah. 7 to 22 I had no idea like what was going on I know that I like had a really big fear about being sick but I didn't actually know that it was a thing and I didn't even think to Google it because I thought I was crazy and I was like the only person in the world that would be feeling this way. So I didn't even bother looking it up. Yes. Yeah, I was the same. (laughs) I I didn't, I didn't know. I actually knew, I knew I was different, but I didn't know how different my thinking was to the average person's until Mm -hmm. I've learned about thinking styles and and everything else. 
later in life. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because nobody shares their thoughts. You can't see inside other people's heads to to listen to what they are thinking, people without emetophobia, to understand how different your thinking styles are. Um, yeah. So it's only yeah. when you learn about them, isn't it, that you think, okay, mm-hmm. yep, yeah, there's, <laughs> there's definite work to do yeah. there. Um, so, and yeah, because like great. I, because people don't actually talk about having emetophobia because it is linked yeah. with social anxiety and yeah. there isn't a lot of awareness out there. So, yeah, I had never even heard that it had existed. And I had um, anorexia at the same time as emetophobia and I was fine going to the doctors and getting help for that. And yeah. I just wanted to be like, please help me with like this emetophobia and this fear that I have. But I couldn't yeah. even voice it to a doctor because I didn't Absolutely. think that they would even know what it is. I didn't want to have to explain it to them so then they could yeah. treat me. So I yeah. just kind of said nothing. Yeah. yeah. So what was the difference out of interest? I, I didn't have an anorexia. So what was the difference between being able to ask for help for anorexia than emetophobia? What was different about that? Um, I think just because anorexia is known it's more accepted like I didn't want to say I have this fear of being sick and they'll just be like look at me funny or be like what's that or you know like that doesn't exist whereas like anorexia was something that I was going through and it was something that was treatable yeah brilliant okay so when did you hear about it then when did emetophobia enter your awareness So I think, yeah, it was around the age of 22 and I just Googled it randomly, like fear of being sick or I'm scared to be sick or something like that. And Mm -hmm. then all this information came up saying like you'd have to do exposure therapy or you could only manage your symptoms. And I think it was just this one day that I had Googled it and I was just like, oh, this I'm going to be stuck with this forever. Like it's because of this traumatic incident that happened to me. So, you know, there's nothing that I can do about it. So right. then I saw the. Do you mind? Sorry to interrupt you. Do you do you mind me asking what the the traumatic incident was? Do you mind me? Sharing it wasn't. That? E- it wasn't even that traumatic. Um, <laughs> so what happened was we. It was to you it though. To a traumatic incident, but yeah, but it was to you at the time, wasn't it? <laughs> it? Was yes, yeah, yes. And yes. I had I had never been sick before either, and that just goes mm-hmm. to show that emetophobia is not about being sick because Absolutely. I couldn't even recall the time being sick. So this was the only thing that I could pinpoint it back to. So I was sitting having um, like, I don't know what it was, like a milkshake or something with like my family, my nan and pop. And then there was a disabled person across from us. And then he was sick all over the table. And my nan (sighs) grabbed me and was like, don't look and like raced us away. And then in my brain, I was like, oh, you cannot be sick in public, like, public because it's so embarrassing. And like, it was just such a big like thing to them, like to get us yes. away. And I was like, oh, yes. if I did that and I made someone feel that fear, like that would just be yeah. horrible. So it was kind of from there, I was like, okay, I can never be sick in public. Yes. And then so, I would just yeah. think about it every single day and I would just replay it over and over. And I was like, okay, like it has to be some kind of like, post-traumatic stress thing yeah. because yeah. you know every time I felt nervous or fearful I would be reminded of this so I just linked it yeah. together to feel like you know that's the yeah. reason why absolutely and I so it didn't even in... happen it didn't even happen to me no <laughs> it doesn't need to though does it it's the no. as we've talked about in in I think the previous podcast or the or one before the last one um with Rob the traumatic event it's the belief you build after it. It's all that processing that you did after it. It's all that yeah. replaying of it and the belief that mm-hmm. you built about being sick. Um, yeah. After that, it's not the event itself, which we know going through the Thrive Program, but for people out there who's never been through the Thrive Program, that can be quite hard to get your head around. Um, it is, So yeah. anyway. Especially interrupt- if, you know, you've been thinking about that for 20 years. You yeah. then don't want to be like, everything that I believe for that long is wrong. Yes. And that I yes. let this debilitate yeah. my life this long because I believed yeah, in absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah. So it yeah. is it is hard absolutely. to kind of let that go. Definitely. A hundred percent. And it's taking ownership of the fact that it was how you processed it and that's an individual thing is I've described it before as like a kick in the guts because you're thinking, I've done this to myself. Um and that's yeah. that's a really hard yeah. thing to yeah. accept. Um yeah. and and 
a bit painful. <laughs> oh, that hurts a little bit. Um, but actually, when you think about it, it's incredibly empowering and mm-hmm. really, really helpful because you can do something about that. You can't change the fact that you were witness to that when you were exactly. you know, younger and you can't change your nan's, your nan's reaction to it, but you can change how you view it and you can change mm-hmm. your beliefs that you've built about it. So it's incredibly empowering once you've got over the initial gut wrench of, oh no, I've done it to myself, <laughs> which mm-hmm. hurts. Exactly. Um, and, and yeah. So the yeah. Thrive Program, we got up to the point in the story where you came across oh, well, yes. emetophobia. Sorry, across yes, the Thrive Program. The, yeah, the Thrive Program, emetophobia yeah. free menu. Yes. And I just bought it and I didn't look at it. So I didn't actually know that there was like no exposure therapy or I didn't even read about it. I just like ordered it and it came. It, yeah. And then yeah. because I had read all that misinformation, I was like, well, what's yeah. the point of doing this? I was in a state where I was just so anxious every day. I was like, I'm going to wait until I feel better to actually like look at it because I just didn't think that I would be able to deal with that on top of everything that was going on. So, um, yeah, it ended up taking three years before I (laughs) opened it. And it was just because I was, I'm in a relationship with my girlfriend and Mm -hmm. she's very like well-educated in like neuroscience and psychology and all that kind of stuff. And mm-hmm. I finally came out and told her that I had emetophobia, which I was so petrified to do because I thought that she would yes. break up with me or, you know, it was, I felt yes. like I didn't have much of a self-worth because of this. Like I just held mm. so much shame around it. And I told her about it and I told her about this manual that I had in the cupboard that I've never looked at. And she's like, can I have a look at it? And I was like, yeah, okay. And she had a look and she just like flicked through. And because like she's so well researched in other things, she looked at it and yeah. she was like, you need to do this. Like you have to do it. Yes. And I was just like, okay, yeah. like if she, <laughs> if she says that it's good, then it must be good. And then yes. I, I started and within two weeks I was like over my emetophobia. And by over so a emetophobia, that's a, I mean that's like, a mic drop moment, Brie. That is that's a <laughs> that is a mic drop moment. <laughs> yeah. Two weeks. Two weeks yeah, of reading weeks. a manual, you're over. Explain. Mm-hmm. Go go into more detail because some people watching this will be going, yeah. no way. No way could you be over yeah. that in, tw- in two weeks. So, so go on, explain. <laughs> yeah, so being over it in two weeks, it went from being, you know, um, like I would rather like die today than be yeah. sick. Like that's yes. the kind of fear that I had yeah. around it. Like yeah. it was just horrible and every day I'd wake up with that dread, like today's the day that's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Like how am I going to mm-hmm. do this again tomorrow? To yeah. Um, it would be like absolutely awful and I would hate it, but I could tolerate it. Like that's yep. where I was at two weeks. So I still Amazing. had like anxiety. I was still like creating yep. anxiety around it, yep. but yep. it wasn't to the point of it was like I couldn't tolerate it. Like I would rather yes. die. It wasn't like that anymore. So once Amazing. I learned that it wasn't because of this incident, I was like, okay, like I can actually do something about it. Whereas Perfect. before it was just like, what's the point? And now I'm being yep. told, you know, you can do it and Mm -hmm. when I set my mind to something I can do it and then I'm like okay like if this is actually doable then I'm gonna do it absolutely yeah Yeah. so a couple of points to pick up on there then your girlfriend who is well versed in cognitive neuroscience did you say is that her Mm -hmm. job okay and then I believe you're a scientist (laughs) as well yeah right yeah (laughs) so that's really important for people listening because a lot of other therapeutic interventions aren't based on neuroscience and they're not based on um the most up-to-date research yeah everything is it's an important point to get across that everything in this manual has evidential backing there is research to support it and all the research is there isn't it so obviously when your girlfriend flicked through she saw Mm -hmm. okay well there's the skill that they're talking about there's all the research that backs it up and it's all contained Mm -hmm. in that manual Um, yeah exactly which is um yeah and I went from not telling anybody that I had a metaphobia, thinking no one would understand to mm-hmm. I opened up the manual and I remember like reading Rob Broit like have a cup of tea and check the expiry. And I was like, how did he know that? Yeah. And it was like those little <laughs> specific details that I was like, yes. wow, like he actually knows a metaphobia. Mm-hmm. And yes. I was like, 100% this is going to work. And I think yes. that was a big thing for me was, I hadn't been through like different types of therapies. So Mm -hmm. I wasn't like 
confused about what I needed to do. I was like, this is the manual. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do it exactly. And it's going to work. I wasn't like trying to like take tips from what I had learned in therapy or what a doctor had told me, like this was all I knew. So I just did it. Ah, okay. So that, that's an interesting point as well, isn't it? So there could be a, yeah, layover from past therapies and past interventions. Yeah, if yeah. you've tried things in yeah. the past, because I tried all sorts. Uh, as I've mentioned before, I tried CBT, I tried EMDR, I was treated for PTSD with the EMDR, I tried all sorts of different things before I found this. Um, mm-hmm. And it was, I think, similar. The way that the manual is written, because it's so, I want to call it down to earth. It's, it's it written is. in a really accessible way, really easy to understand way. I remember when I started reading it uh, myself, I was giggling at parts. I was, I was yeah, laughing. I was like, too. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was going, oh, yeah, that's me. <laughs> and and it's really so nice because I, yeah, as I said, I didn't pick it up for three years because I thought yeah. that it was going to be terrifying. And I was yes. the same. I was actually laughing. Yeah, which is <laughs> and looking so forward refreshing. to reading it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, which is so, so refreshing. Um, other therapies, uh, there's, a, there's a very different experience of other yeah. therapies and it's important as well that the majority of people who go through this actually quite enjoy the experience because it's so empowering it's so liberating mm-hmm. and you feel so understood and heard um yeah just by reading this manual and that's a um, another important point I want to just hammer home as well is that you got yourself to the point where you thought I could cope with that with two mm-hmm. weeks without a coach just yeah. you just reading mm-hmm. it through at home so you can get over this there's there's multiple multiple people of hundreds of people who have got over it with just the manual but it's brilliant that you're there and people can contact you and can talk to you about that experience um if you can't yes. afford a coach or you'd prefer to do it on your own it's doable it's totally doable I always refer to I'm gonna to refer to you now but also Mary <laughs> so Mary who was yeah. you know she had it for 75 years and she got if over Mary it can do it anyone can do it <laughs> That's exactly it. <laughs> yeah. That is exactly it. So when did it, so you got to two weeks being, yes, yes I can, I could cope with this. And that's probably <sighs> me being a scientist in my black and white brain. It was like, click, like, okay, it wasn't Perfect. because this happened to me. I can actually do something about it. So I'm going to do something about it. Yes. Brilliant. So black and white thinking is obviously part of what makes up <laughs> the emetophobia but actually what you've done as we well know that none of those thinking styles the perfectionist thinking style the catastrophic thinking style none of them are actually bad particularly it's only when they are applied to areas of your life where they become unhelpful like emetophobia so when black and white becomes applied to emetophobia in terms of i'm stuck with it i can't get out of it and actually being sick is the worst thing in the world full stop Mm -hmm. then it's unhelpful but when you flip it round and go well actually i can do something Mm -hmm. about this and you use the black yeah. and white thinking to your advantage. That's great. So it's like a, yeah. it's a toolkit, isn't it? It's it's a it's a mental health toolkit that you gain when you go through the program. Uh, mm-hmm. One of the tools is how to manage your thinking styles to good effect, to use them to yes. help you rather than hinder you. <laughs> yes, yeah. exactly. Okay. Yeah. So two weeks was I can cope with this. What was after that? After the two weeks, how did it? continue to progress where is life what's life like for you now oh life now is great I'm not held back by any kind of anxiety whatsoever and Brilliant. I've actually been sick a few times since I've never I was never sick when I had a metaphobia I've been sick yep. now and it's not because I'm now a metaphobia free and I'm doing yep. risky things um yeah. it just so happened that I was and I was yeah. actually completely fine I remember being in the shower afterwards and thinking like this is the best day of my life I feel awful <laughs> but like this doesn't it's not holding me back anymore like it's yes. done it's over and yeah. um now I I'm up for anything like I do lots of travel with my girlfriend we went and did Perfect. a hike through the blue mountains or we go snowboarding nice. I have a daughter I look after her when she's sick um yes. Uh, yeah I'm not held back by anything Amazing. I think the Amazing. biggest thing is like you know waking up and it's just peaceful like I don't have that initial yeah. fear when I wake up anymore and I can actually like have conversations with people and just be fully present and yes it's really nice because before I'd be talking yeah. to people and I'd just be in my head like 
what did I eat this morning? Like, what did I touch? And I wasn't actually there. Like I was like talking to people, but I wasn't actually, you know, engaging with them or felt like I was present talking to them. Yes, absolutely. Which is why it's so draining living with emetophobia because your brain is constantly going. feels like your head's full all the time, like a big big cotton wool ball all the time, all tangled up, constantly whirring. And it's incredibly tiring and it exhausting is. and yeah it takes it takes the joy and the enjoyment out of life it does. doesn't it because you want the to be out of it yeah yeah yeah, yeah for you sure you want to be present and you want to be there and talking to people and engaging fully but you can't at that moment because your head's so full of anxiety and worry and hypervigilant thoughts is that safe yeah. is that safe is am I going to get sick from that okay yeah so exactly yeah, so there's there's lots to discuss, and Brie has got so much there about is. her story <laughs> I could that we talk could about dive into. Forever. <laughs> yes, so we're going to do uh, like a mini series of Brie, uh, which is really exciting. So we're going to talk about pregnancy because you were pregnant when you had a metaphobia, weren't you? Pregnant with a metaphobia yes. and which yeah. postpartum as well. Yeah, so I think we we will have a chat about it offline but I really think that we could separate those two because I think they can be separated and it would make yeah. a really good podcast and that's both what's sides. very in my mind because it happened yes. recently yes how old's your daughter now she's three. Oh. <laughs> so yeah <laughs> recently it's so lovely so that'd be great but also we could chat to anorexia as well okay because there will be other people yeah. out there you know who are yes. struggling with both um, and that yeah. could be another podcast. So we are going to do a Brie mini series, which is really exciting. <laughs> this is. one was, um, yeah, which is a, an introduction to Brie and to say that, you know, even though she didn't need a coach going through this, um, in fact, you tell, you you explain what was the driving force behind becoming a coach if you didn't need one when you went through it, you just did it with the manual. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, what, 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 once I overcame emetophobia and... I just realized like how simple it actually was and how debilitating I allowed it to be. I was like, I need to help people. Like I just finished my degree in medical science and I've been trained up in that. And now I do both of these things because I just feel like I have to, like I have to help people. I have to be able to tell them that they can do this. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, And it's, um... and I'd love, I'd love to be able to help people. So perfect perfect so she is up and running now you can contact her she's on the website um on instagram she's there um and i think it's a really lovely way to raise awareness so coming on the podcast is a really good way to raise awareness as you said when you wanted to share about your anorexia that felt easier because that was more widely known well emetophobia as they know the research suggests that as high as between five and eight percent of the population actually suffer with this but it's not but spoken about it's knows. not very well nobody knows so and that's this is I'm really important yeah, yeah did you say you had I a created like an instagram yeah and i had a meeting with um headspace and i spoke to a bunch exciting. of um psychologists and social workers and only one person knew what emetophobia was but they'd never actually treated anybody with it and then right. once i actually told them all about emetophobia they're like oh, i think that i've got patients that have this and yeah we really need to raise that awareness because there's so much shame and guilt for me at least I don't know if you Mm -hmm. felt like that like it's Mm -hmm. just yeah it just held me back from so much and I felt like I couldn't actually speak up about it and that's something that I did do when I was doing the program is I started saying that I was an ex-emetophobe and telling people about it even though I still was an emetophobe because I had so much social anxiety about it I still yeah. didn't want to say, like, I am this. I would say, yes, I'm an ex and I used to do this. And they'll be like, oh, I remember, like, you know, you don't drink alcohol and you don't eat meat. And they would add yes. all these things up. And they were actually so thankful that I had told them because they felt like yeah. they understood me so much better and everything kind of made sense as to why I did all these little quirky things. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and yeah. I told my um my dad only like a few weeks ago. I didn't even tell my parents until after I was completely emetophobia free. And right. my dad was like crying, being like, I feel like oh. I just know you now, like everything makes sense. So 
Oh. I just wish that I could have reached out and like told people yeah. about it because nobody actually cares. Like I thought it was going to be the biggest no. deal in the world and people would think so badly of me and actually people are just like, oh, it's just like a little thing about you that they know now, you know. That's it. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. entirely it. That's exactly how I thought as well. Yeah. Um, I didn't want to because I thought it was such a massive thing for me. It really yes, it rules you. your day, doesn't it? It rules your life mm-hmm. when you're living with it. Um, but for everybody else, all they see is those little safety seeking and avoidance behaviors that you do. And you think mm, that's a, that's a, that's an odd habit or that's a strange thing to do, but they don't understand the cause and they don't understand the severity of it in your head. And to be able to have yeah. a little insight into that is really refreshing for them because then they can understand. It's probably worth talking a little bit now about the people in your life that you would call significant others um, who were with you at the time of going through emetophobia and how they yes. either supported you or um, how that relationship developed. And I, I've just thought of another podcast just now. You said <laughs> you were you were dating. So that's, I think that's five up to now. You were dating at the time and didn't tell your girlfriend about metaphobia um, and yes. I think we could ha- also have a podcast about that because I met my who is now my husband and I had a metaphobia at the time and I think I told him on date three because I couldn't get out of telling him oh, wow. if I could have <laughs> if I could have got out of telling him longer than I would have done uh, but the circumstances surrounded it I was like I, I, I can't I'm gonna have to tell him <laughs> so I think yeah. that's a, another one but do you want to talk about your girlfriend and if she was you know if she did she read it alongside you the manual how did she support you through it what went on no yeah she flipped through it and was like you need to do this so I started reading it and I am so annoying like I talk about emetophobia all the time and she listens but she never (laughs) once colluded with me since I told her that I had emetophobia she didn't even know that it was a thing she just because she kind of reads all this kind of stuff she knew and she challenges me which I don't I wouldn't say that I like highly recommend having your partner challenge you on every single thing because no, nope. it wears thin, like especially yeah. when it's around something that is like frightening to you. I think that that was a really like significant thing about me going through the program was I didn't have a significant other that was still colluding with me. Like I never had that with her. And I think yes. that was extremely helpful because I just always had to be challenging my thoughts. And that's the point of it. Like, yes to just make this your number one priority to do, just put all your effort in. And yeah, I didn't have somebody kind of making it easy for me. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So when we talk about colluding, um, it's worth just clarifying what we mean there. Yeah. When somebody colludes with you, they don't need to be an emetophobe themselves, but they can almost make it harder for you to get through the program by allowing you to keep your perspective that being sick is terrifying it's really um helpful to have somebody there that knows how to support you going through the program in the the right way because people who do collude the majority of the time they're doing it out of love they're doing it to try yeah, and help because they don't know how to help any other way um so when I was trying to go through it there were certain members of my family who were very collusive with me but purely because they wanted to help and purely because they yeah. wanted to make me feel comfortable so if I was you know at, at their house they would go would you want to eat that do you, do you want to cook it do you want do you want to you sort yours out and, I, and I'll do the rest of everybody else's and that's they were doing that to make me to help me feel calmer and to have a nicer mm-hmm. experience there but actually what that is saying to me in, in an underhandy kind of way is you need to do that that's you're, you're different okay that's actually there could be germs on my hands I could be doing it wrong you know there could be a risk here of getting sick so it's it's really unhelpful behavior yeah. and a better way would be this is how I prepare meals and have done for the for, forever mm-hmm. I'm fine the rest of the family are fine you'd be fine you'd cope and that's empowering yeah. that's helpful that's allowing you to look at it in a helpful way, in an empowered empowered way, rather yeah. than, no, I need to keep hold of these safety-seeking behaviours. But it's totally understandable yeah. why people do that. And it's, it's challenging it with evidence too, to just be like, yeah. you know, I've done it this whole time, like no one's ever been sick, you know. That's it. Yeah, that's yeah. it. And not just having that thought once, you have to continually guide your mind back to that because mm-hmm. logically you'll know that, but you won't have been brooding about that you won't have been sticking to your guns on that you look on yes I know that but 
and you'll have been allowing your thoughts to go back to those really unhelpful emetophobia yeah. thoughts and it's really it's it's gently kindly to yourself going that's not going to allow me to build the life that I want here. It's not going to allow yeah. me to have the experience that I want of life if I keep believing that and I keep playing that thought over and over in my head, that unhelpful thought, this is. So I need to keep really gently guiding myself back in a really kind, compassionate, nurturing way towards myself. This is yeah. the life I want. I want to, I want to be free of emetophobia. Therefore, this is the belief I need to have about this situation. And yeah. people helping you do that, and allowing you to gain that perspective and supporting you on that journey is really helpful. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. It will make it easier for you. Definitely. Definitely. Lovely. Another tip right, okay. that I had Go on. was um, the, I was really fearful of reading the manual because I thought that it was going to talk about sickness a lot. And yes. we know that it's about focusing on getting you thriving rather than mm. overcoming mm. emetophobia because you have emetophobia because you're not thriving. So yes. I think that's a really important one to make because if people do feel like they do have a lot of fear about starting, because yes. for me that's that's how I felt. So yeah. it it's not like that at all. It is very empowering and funny. And yes. it's really simple to understand as well. And mm. I like to refer it like walking through like a modern art gallery you know how you see like a painting and it's like it might just be white or there's like one strip through it and yes. someone will be like I could have done that or like you're walking through the markets and people see yes. something handmade and they're like I could have done that and you're just like yeah, yeah but you didn't do it and it's kind yeah. of like that like you're reading the manual and you're like oh I could do that I could do that that concept is yes. really easy but if you're not actually doing it it's not going to work it's one thing to yeah. read it and understand it, but it's another thing entirely to like keep applying it every single yeah. day. And Absolutely. it's it's something that is really simple to do, but you have to do it. And I think yeah. that's how I was able to overcome it is I actually did every single thing that it said the way that it was intended and every single yes. day. Yeah. Yes. And it was and easy. Like it doesn't have to be extremely hard and like difficult yeah. concepts. You just have no. to do it consistently. Yes, and it feels clunky and unusual, <laughs> but it has yeah. to feel clunky and unusual because you are breaking a habit. You've been in a habit of creating a metaphobia for 20-odd years of your life, and now you're thinking differently. So that's going to feel clunky, exactly. and that's going to feel unusual. Yeah. It has to. That's where the growth happens. But it's not mm -hmm. clunky and unusual is like doing something that you, you I don't know, driving – driving in a different country when you go on on holiday and you swap sides of the road i don't know what what side do they drive in australia is it left or right left Opposite. left <laughs> that's the same, same that's the same as here yeah <laughs> so if you go to on holidays from country and drive on the yeah there we go drive on the right hand side of the road gosh we did that we went on our honeymoon to america and we had a, a, a night flight and it was we were very very sleep deprived and then we got into this foreign country with this massive great big pickup truck on the wrong side of the road we we're like right <laughs> what do we do here now that takes effort right it takes real effort to, and concentration to drive on the wrong side of the road and the wrong side of the car you have to really think about that it's yeah, not massively do. difficult yeah it's not impossible and it's not mm -hmm. massively difficult but it's it takes effort and that's the same with it this does. program it, it is, takes effort yeah. because it's not your habit. It's not your usual way of doing things. It just feels a little bit, it's, it's not yeah. quite comfortable. And it's and weird to think that good. living in fear is comfortable and that feels safe yes. to you. Yes. you know? And yes. this is something yeah. that's good for you and is going to make you feel really good every day, but it's uncomfortable yeah. to get there. But yes. eventually you do. It becomes do. habitual the way that you challenge your thoughts and you think. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And it has... I said this multiple times, it has such an impact on your life in general. So it's not just, yeah. you don't just get over your metaphobia because you learn to thrive. Yeah. Every area yeah. of your life is so much better. Work is better. Relationships are better. Mm -hmm. Hobbies. Every area of your life, you feel more confident. Yeah. You're able to enjoy so much more um, and manage any stress and anxiety is so minimal because you know that you're creating it and therefore you don't create it because you're yeah. thinking in such a habitually thrivey way. Um, so it's massively empowering, completely backed by research. Um, and 
evidence-based. I'll, I'll, I'm going to cut that yeah. out because that doesn't make sense either. But, <laughs> no, it does. but yes. I think that's a really good but, point to make. Yeah, it is It is about yeah. thriving and that is something that I focused on rather than overcoming a metaphobia because I did have yes. anxiety and depression and anorexia. Uh-huh. So I wasn't uh-huh. just going into it, you know, just doing, and it said focus on thriving. So I was like, okay, Absolutely. I'm doing what this book yes. says. I'm focusing on thriving. And Perfect. I had had times before where, my self-confidence was really good and I felt amazing like in myself where I had fun things coming up and I just felt good in general and I was like oh I don't really have those thoughts today and if I was sick today I could tolerate it more and I know there's probably people with a metaphobia out there that have had those really good days and that's what it's Mm -hmm. like it's when you're feeling thrivey you don't have a metaphobia Metaphobia. and that's what it's like so you don't have to keep thinking all day like what it's going to be like to not have a metaphobia like if you're thriving you won't be thinking yes in that limit like limit t- I can't say that word <laughs> limiting way <laughs> limiting powerless way <laughs> yes yes perfect so I think we'll leave it there because if we don't okay. I think unless you've got anything else that you want to share any bits of advice any other nuggets of information on this first of our brie marathon no. I think that, that they were my tips, Perfect. applying the concepts, focusing yes. on thriving. Yes. And I forget the other one. Yeah. Having somebody that is kind of challenging. Not colluding, you, or, yes. And not spending a lot of time with someone colluding with you. Perfect, yep. Yeah. Yeah. And if the people who um, have got the manual now, or are working through it at the back of the manual, it's worth pointing out that there is a significant others tear out, um, which you can literally go and give, tear out of the manual and give to your significant other. So whoever lives with you, um, it's worth them having a read because that will allow them to see the way in which they can support you best as you move through the program. Another point is if you have given them the significant tear out, make sure that you have uh, signed up to the emails and the newsletter because in there there's going to be some new resources coming up um, about how to support somebody who you are living with or who is close to you who has a metaphobia so it's kind of like a how-to guide for them um, and they will be all released on the newsletter as well I'll, I'll put something on social media as well but keep, make sure you're signed up to those as well yeah I think that's super helpful I actually did a poll on my Instagram story asking people if they've ever told anyone about their emetophobia and the most yeah. popular answer was they had told their best friend or their partner so yeah. that's probably the person they're spending the most amount of time with so it is really helpful to get them on board absolutely absolutely but you don't want to damage Brilliant. your relationship at the same time no <laughs> no <laughs> no so but giving them a tear out to me is not going to damage the relationship yeah so it would be all right there that's fine yeah but right. i did want to so, say if anybody out yeah. there can't afford a coach and they are going through just with the manual and they do yeah. need any questions answered they can message me because perfect yeah i, d- I just want to help people like i know how debilitating a metaphobia is and i'm here to yes. help if they have any questions perfect. you can ask me perfect very kind thank you very much that's wonderful we'll leave it there for today um, and Brie will be back with us soon um, to talk all things relationships dating pregnancy and postpartum <laughs> but Brie it's lovely to see you thank you very much for being here and uh, we'll thank see you, you soon all right, thanks take for care. Me. bye